Good evening. Welcome to this Poem City event. I'm Tom McCone, Executive Director of the Kellogg Hubbard Library. It's great to have you with us. We have 35 events this month, 35 poetry events around town. And this evening, we're very pleased to have two fine poets with us, Francette Cerulli and Jamie Gage. Jamie's poetry has been published in numerous journals, including Main Street Rag, Inkwell, Out of Line, and Mountain Gazette. And his new book, True If Destroyed, was published just in two months ago, February. Yeah. Fran Cerulli has also been published in numerous journals, and she's the author of The Spirits Need to Eat. Fran's poetry has been read on National Public Radio and Garrison Keillor's uh, Writer's Almanac. So I, I heard that, and I thought, well, that's pretty cool to get, you know, have Garrison Keillor read your poetry on national public radio. And then I went to the um, Writer's Almanac website, and he's read your poetry at least four times. Three? Yeah. Oh. He's, maybe you missed one, because he's got four on the website. Oh, yeah. Maybe you did read four, and I just forgot. Well, that's pretty cool. I don't know how you worked that deal. I don't know either, I did not send him my book. It just, I don't know how he got my book. Oh. They called me, I thought it was a joke. <laughs> <laughs> well, on that note, I think we'll, we'll start with Jamie. How about that? Would you please welcome Jamie Gage? <laughs> Thank you very much. It might have been Peter Holmes. Uh, maybe Peter Senna. Um, and thank you, Tom, very much. And thank you to everyone here uh, who's, uh, who are involved with Poem City. It's a fantastic event. I got involved with it a few years ago and uh, really uh, very excited by it. I'm excited that it moves people uh, to write poetry. We need words now more than ever. Um, and I think this is uh, one of the most unique events um, in the United States. I don't believe that this is done anywhere else still at this point, which is very cool. And to see all these broadsides all around town is really neat. And it really pushes us all. And it, and it pushed me uh, personally. Um, and it's engendered other movements like Hometown Randolph, where I'm from, that started three years ago. There's a Hometown Saranac Lake, Norwich University. I think there may be, there was one other town. And then poems across Vermont in the Welcome Centers, which is a very cool thing. I got involved with that a few years ago as well, which is very cool to have people be able to stop and uh, when they get to a rest area, see what we think, what Vermonters feel and believe in the form of poetry, which is great. Words matter. So thank you for pushing this. Don't ever stop. This is a very cool thing. And I'm always very happy to, uh, to see these broadsides around town in my own town now. Um, in fact, um, you know, that's really what pushed me uh, a little bit forward to write um, more and to get these poems out. These are mostly older poems, but it kind of propelled me to start sending things out. Um, and this collection uh, was sent out to a, a chapbook competition, and it was awarded a semifinalist um, prize, and then they offered to publish it for no cost, which was fantastic. So thank you again. Um, the other thing um, that really propelled me um, about 15 years ago to start writing poetry was you know, current events and world events, Poets Against the War uh, in 2002 and three really um, moved a lot of people. And so um, that's when I think I first started writing. It was kind of a catharsis. Um, and that's kind of what my poetry is about, is, is kind of a, I got to get this out. You know, it's got to be put down on paper. And it's a, it's a good process uh, for me personally. Um, so this first poem was written about that, about that time and carries with it the theme of uh, current events in war. <coughs> it's called Archipelago, and it starts with an epigraph. To do evil, a human being must first believe that what he is doing is good. Alexander Solzhenitsyn. 
Torture is a word with more than four letters, but of course there are worse. Words like earlobe or gulag or Bagram Air Base, places you hoped your concealment might keep you from seeing. It has been 12 years since Alexander returned to the taiga, 12 years since he left us for dusk, and the world is the same now, but different. The appeals have grown louder. The court has drawn down its heavyweight robes, and butterflies are trapped in their vestments. The bailiff keeps checking his watch. Still, the old man in the back stares stalwartly on. Beard spilling from his eyes like silver tailings from a mine, he is quiet. There is too much to say, and he's already said it, bellowed from the hemlocks in his solitary cells against the fear and the hate for the hope and the love without raising his voice, without raising his hand. Through ribboning birch, the snow hums down like an iron branding on skin. A voice rings out and then fades, swallowed by a silence that spreads like an ink blot. And uh, every poet needs an editor. I want to acknowledge that my wife uh, encouraged me to drop another line that was previously ending that poem years ago and made that poem end and uh, made it what it was. So thank you. And she's in the back with my two little ones. This next one is a, a relatively new, it's probably one of the newest poems I've written just a couple months ago. Maleg, 1901. Not even so much the wind or the cliffs, but the musk of the air when it's calm, balmy, you can taste it, the sweet smoke cells of the Gulf Stream and the peat meeting sea. Down current from the south, it rolls over. Your eyes peer through pinched lids and then finally tear up. And that's when the malt runs the gullet so well, when the waterfalls empty glaciers onto fossilized bones, before the mammoths and the ungulates the hairy uprights with their brows pressed and hunched over, so proud above their new open flame. This is another relatively new one. Crush. The Oristanos in 84, Phil and isn't it strange how I can't remember her name? But boy, wasn't she something to look at. A real bespectacled beauty, and didn't I dream of gently removing those broad-rimmed frames to reveal her azure-eyed gaze, returning the love I hoped so much to impart on her, this gorgeous somehow other man's wife. I was 14 at the time, and it may have been the first, first occasion of many in my life when I'd wondered incredulously, what the hell is she doing with that guy? Phil, indeed. After all, she was the sculptor and the sculpted, a muse and a maker, both fueling my Saturday forward through this coffee cup still endowing my name 30 years later, Jamie's mug, and enriching my memory, rose-hued such as it is. And why not? My father taught her to ski, and her goateed husband, too. I was just a spectator then, drinking it in. Mostly I remember her clear skin and blue eyes tempered by those thick glasses as if to reflect my own crush back or keep it safely at bay. I recall her in a one-piece ski suit making wedge turns between the rock walls of the Wasatch looking especially fine. And where is she now? In my mind I picture her own Saturday morning in a suburb of some city not far away still wearing her nightgown and drinking coffee from a cup that she made with her hands. Jean, I remember now, her name was Jean. As I mentioned, most of the poems in, in this collection are between 10, 10 and 20 years old. There's only a few that are less than 10 years old. This is an old one, probably closer to 20. Abundance, and it's the first one in the collection. Abundance. 
There is something that happens when we lie down with each other that is beyond even my best recollection of ourselves, beyond this rush of salt air through the truck's open window or the unsettled haze settled over the bay, unseasonal haze settled over the bay. It's October and you're as clear in my mind as you've ever been, as beautiful as words that I don't need to say because you are near and because I have gazed for so long through the shade of your orbit. The fact is, I have no words for this love. It is an entity unto itself, like the clang call of an ocean buoy or your ink-stained, unwavering eyes. Uh, this one is uh, one of the newer ones in this collection, um, and it's dedicated to the two uh, blonde children in the back. <clears throat> <clears throat> <laughs> it's called Children of the Woods. When she hands me an oak leaf or a fistful of needles for the fourth time this morning, I'm struck by how much my daughter resembles her brother, his summer brown skin and half-curled grin, the other half level with earnestness. As we round a bend in the root-strewn trail that we began clearing last weekend, I can hear Aiden's seesaw cadence call out from behind a thicket of spruce. He's singing one of his favorites, Old MacDonald, and when he comes to the line that he has made up about his pig dog friend with the upturned snout, I can hear him howling and grunt barking, then his sister laughing through the cone-bearing boughs. This is the morning I've dreamed of that I have forever wanted to live. These children of the woods are trees of their own, above all else I have known. Uh, this one is um, dedicated and came about because of my father. He was a kind of a unique uh, old curmudgeon, very stubborn, did his own thing, and a lot of sort of uh, what we consider unique Vermont idiosyncrasies, and stubborn right to the end. He passed five years ago, and, and he, he kind of maintained that attitude all those years, right up until the end, or tried to. Um, he was 83. Um, it's called my father last night. My father last night stoked the wood fire, drank the cold draft, ate the tea bone, ignored the doc's calls, cursed the ex-prez, read the good book, gazed at the sky, limped up the stairs, popped all the pills, cranked up the brass, oiled down the steel, fell through the chair, dropped the left eye, and drove the storm home. Drove the storm home. A good friend of mine um, in those days of uh, the Iraq War um, was, he was a Gulf War veteran and he became a great teacher of media reform in English in, in uh, Harwood in uh, Waitsfield or Duxbury. And uh, he was very involved in the anti-war movement as was I to some extent. And anyway, we went down to Washington in October of 2002, six months in advance of the eventual Iraq war that we got into. It's part of a protest movement. We went down on a bus, and this, uh, this poem came out of that experience. It was also a very heady time with um, the Patriot Act and Ryson being sent to the Senate, uh, you know, senators' offices and a lot of terror going on. Uh, a couple, couple guys were driving around and shooting people, if you remember that, uh, anonymously. And uh, so, it's a pretty, pretty heady time. So this, uh, this was some catharsis for sure in this, uh, uh, this poem. It's called Safe Passage. In the clipped half-light between the highway and glass, I met death yet again. 
Yet again, as though I'd always meant death right here on this bus. Always this night with a still moon on the wane over Wellstone and other historical ghosts only recently passed, all of them moving through us on this slow roll to Washington to meet democracy by morning. <coughs> I'll say this, I haven't missed this rain, or I've forgotten now what it could possibly mean. Weak kneed, slack jawed, my neck a burnt piece of sausage, the slap slap of wipers against the windshield. It's just that now, upon waking, it feels different. This dream, this death, feels better than I ever remembered it. It feels like this night, surrounded by friends whose names I don't know, but whose cores I imagine my own core to be, without malice, laid open clean. The way humans can be when they're able to choose. But there was this also, lust, a going in and a coming out, but bloodless, a kind of throughway like this road to the Potomac, further among the children of the ghost dance who pass in their red yellow bus, further among the fear in the suburbs, and yet that fear fades because we make it fade. We are all, after all, in death as in life, waltzing the rain. We are dancing with ghosts. I'll say this, I would die for my country. I would die for my country if it would live up to me. Uh, this last poem in the collection is, uh, uh, takes its name for the, from the Vermont State Bird, which is the hermit thrush. It also starts with an epigraph. Uh, this one by John Updike, which I thought was really, uh, really encapsulated the theme. Um, and it's probably better than the poem itself. It, it reads, the essence of the super rich is absence. They're always demonstrating they can afford to be someplace else. Again, that was John Updike. <laughs> Hermit thrush. I always enjoy the dream where the small birds defend us. Lightning troves of hermit thrush in a line above us as we climb Lincoln Peak. The dream begins where our feet leave off, off the dim granite edge and into the dark. The cat tracks we follow lead to Heliodor mansions now gouged into the hills, ringed by rock walls and stone pillared gates. Nobody's home, so we go inside. Gilt edged mirrors line the great halls, bird antique floors, and glass chandeliers. Claw-footed tubs adorn the boudoir, and yet the place is still empty, still empty and still. I'm hungry, you tell me, and when I glance in the mirror, I can see that we've both sprouted talons. We've grown ourselves wings. When you turn toward the window, the moon glints off your beak. They'll never miss these, you tell me, as you row a dozen Swiss chocolates under your wing. <laughs> but we've got to do something, I'm yelling. The river is ruined. The mountain's been mined. Relax, you laugh, drooling crystal through your black sequin feathers. Don't worry, the ruins. And remember, we'll be here long after they're gone. So in, when I was asked to, or when Rachel and, and uh, Tom had approached me about reading, um, you know, they pair a lot of folks together um, for these readings, obviously, and suggested that I have a, a somebody read with me. And uh, the first person that sprung to mind uh, was Fran Cerulli. Um, and I had first met Fran through a mutual friend, Peter Holm, who was the book designer on her uh, book, The Spirits Need to Eat, which uh, she's going to share some fantastic work from. I was writing book reviews at the time in southern Vermont. And I did a two-part review and interview series for a, a magazine down there called the Vermont Review. Um, and I loved the book. I uh, loved the, the work. It was very, very similar to mine in terms of uh, some catharsis, some personal mining, really digging, which is so important um, and so, so valuable. Um, and uh, there's a number of poems um, that really struck me. And uh, I wanted to read one um, from the collection, and, and Fran said that would be okay. She wouldn't read that particular poem 
Um, it kind of encapsulates the need to really mine some of those unpleasant topics we don't want to talk about um, and that we need to, you know, that we need to kind of go after and dig in and, uh, and observe. This isn't a dark poem at all, but it just, it's one of those moments that you need to kind of look at. Um, and a lot of poetry that Fran writes is, is similar to this. This one's called <coughs> Grace, and it ends the uh, first section of her book. Grace. We must not turn on the lights in our houses until the sun has been down for one hour. We must sit here at the window or there on the porch or just around the kitchen table wherever it catches us and watch it leave. We must remember the time when we had nothing against the dark. We must remember the easy grace of letting darkness fall. Thank you. Thank you. I have to thank Jamie. He sort of dragged me out of retirement. <laughs> uh, <laughs> thank you. And also, uh, I'd like to thank Palm City. It's just gotten bigger and bigger every year. It's so beautiful. Uh, and Rachel, for starting it. I just think it's amazing. Um, let's see here. I really was ready. Um, I did have a list, and I still have a list, um, but my daughter's here, and I wasn't sure she was going to be here, so I'm going to add a poem for her um, as we get into it. Um, one of the first things that Jamie mentioned was how important words are, and uh, the first poem I'd like to read is about that very thing. It's called Sun in Morning, and I wrote it from the point of view of my father. Um, who came home from the church after his mother uh, had died and talked about her funeral and how pissed he was at the priest. Um, so this is in the voice of my father, a son in mourning. The priest chews gum and says words over my mother that are supposed to sound like grief. I look at him and wonder, he is somewhere else he is not even trying to step into my skin for a moment. He didn't even ask for the stories. If he did, I would have told him how she wore a hat with a blue feather, the same blue as that dress, how she sat on a stool to do the ironing. If he had asked, I would have told him how we loved to pick her up and carry her around when we finally got big. But I would not tell him about the bread dough, how when she was done kneading it and it was resting on the table, she would let me cup my hand over it just for a minute. The little mound of dough was warm and softly blistering, and I was starting to wonder about girls. And just as I was about to keel over from pleasure, this woman, my mother, would laugh and give me a whack on the rump and tell me to go out and play. <laughs> I would maybe, maybe tell him about the dress and maybe the hat with the blue feather. But no, not even that, because now as I look at him and wonder and watch him saying those words that don't touch skin, I want to scream at him. Don't you know we live by the word? Don't you know that words leave one body to enter another? That the word hot makes us jump? Stubbed makes our big toe hurt? And when we hear cut, we smell disinfectant. So I sit here not believing it. I watch in wonder as he flings words out of his mouth without loving them first. Amazed, I watch the words jump out of his blood in terror, loud and dry, and not one of them, the one I've been waiting for. 
I turn away in wonder and start to listen for one quiet word. Soak it patiently for months in this roar of sad blood. I heft it in my hand, bring it to my mouth, taste comfort and salt. And uh, I would like to read, um, I usually read lots of poems for my daughters, but this time reading through my poems in this book, I realized that um, I wrote a number of poems for my son, and many of them, he was at the age that my grandsons are now. So I'm gonna read a lot of poems about boys. But I'd like to read one for Zephyr because she's here and she is the mother of one of those boys. <laughs> so um, this is called a Valentine for Zephyr, age 12. The night before Valentines are due, I take you to the movie about Vincent, whose paintings you love. Too late, I realize it's a mistake. You knew about his ear, and you know the definition of prostitute, but neither one of us was ready to see him cut himself until he bled, see him in the brothel with his rotten teeth and his real women. On the way home in the starry night, we hold hands, wonder what his parents must have been like, what cruelty may have happened to him, and you show me the belt of Orion, clean and shining and always in place. Remember this forever then, I cannot imagine not loving you, even when this body is gone. So if I ever die, <laughs> look up into the dark, and find me hundreds of times there, each place you can faintly imagine a line tracing the shape of a valentine. <laughs> and Zephyr always cries at my readings, and I love that. I love it. It's such a gift. It's such a gift to me. Um, but this, this poem that I wrote for my son Tovar, um, the event described in it happened around the age that Zephyr's son Ari is now. Um, he's my youngest grandson. Um, and Ari has kind of the same kind of mind. This is, a, this is a, the kind of thing that my grandson would say. So I'm going to read it. It's called Kinds of Murder for Tovar and Ari. Um, and it's about a fairy tale called Ali Baba and the Forty Thieves, which I'm sure you all know. Uh, walking to the market for milk, I questioned my son casually about the Persian fairy tale. He liked it okay, he says. Speaking from this cool New England hill in summer, instructing my young son, I shudder properly and remind him of all the violence there, of Morgiana pouring hot oil onto the 40 thieves, blistering them to death one by one as they slept in their man-sized oil jars awaiting dawn. But she had to do that, he says. There weren't any police back then. I can see he's back there without me now, roaming through the baked alleys in the stinking heat, smelling sugared almonds, curry, honeyed seed cakes, Pertinent facts start coming back to me that Ali Baba bought the girl in the marketplace, that her beauty would have made her a prostitute except for this man who made her his daughter and loved her in that way only, that they were both lucky and they knew it, that the money for her freedom did indeed come from the thieves' cave and without their permission but it was also their habit to cut people into bits for taking just one piece of gold, then string the flesh up to dry in the hot wind. I think of 40 men with swords sleeping in my little backyard in metal oil drums overnight, the lids slightly tilted for breathing, waiting to hack us apart in the cool Vermont morning. They are dreaming of mistakes my father made years ago. The authorities would never believe me. Stumbling, I check my supply of cooking oil, line up my largest pots on the counter. 
it's the curse and blessing to, of having an imagination. <laughs> and uh, this is called Birthday. It's also for my son, but it could very well be for my grandson, Gabriel, who's now uh, just turned 15. Um, called Birthday. 14 years ago, he slid from me, a squeaking little thing, a boy. He needed pushing and pulling to make him uncurl and brave the light. Again, I see it's all happening too fast for him. His arm and leg bones lengthening by the day. His shoulders, giant coat hangers, barely disguised in skin and muscle. His new body keeps trying to curl up on him, go out of alignment, until he despairs and asks me how to stand up straight. I tell him to pretend there is a string coming out of the top of his head, holding it up, and that everything else will just fall into line. He tries it and laughs. He anticipates that every once in a while, the string will pull a little too tight, and he will be walking in the air. And this is another poem I wrote for Tovar called Sun at 17, but it could be for my 17-year-old grandson, Avery. It's weird how these things happen. Um, called Sun at 17. My son, an expert by overexposure, recognizes the song before I do. The best one of the year about how sex is good for everybody. This large man who was a boy a year ago cranks up the radio till the car is a bulging capsule of sound, heavy on the bass. As he drives, he sings every word loudly with cellular belief. He will have it all, give it all in his time, probably soon. My heart begins to vibrate dangerously at the lowest frequencies. Tonight I feel old enough to be mother to a man. I mime my fear to him, my hand on my chest, my eyes wide. I can feel it in my chest, I scream. He stops singing long enough to nod, delighted that I have noticed. It gets better, he yells. <laughs> and the next two poems I'd like to read are um, in honor of spring. I do not like April. It's really hard for me to get through. And there's a lovely woman in the audience who also hates April. And I, just, I had decided to read a poem for her, and here she, she came. I, I think it's so exciting. Um, the first one, though, is about hanging clothes up on the line. And the first time I read this poem in public, many people came up to me and said, I thought I was the only one who did that. Thank you so much for writing about this. Um, crazy woman hanging out clothes. So here I am, hanging out clothes as the sun goes down. I always miss time that last laundry load. So I'm sending it out on the line into the dark. I look like a crazy woman doing this. People hang clothes out in the morning. I know this. But alone on the back porch, hanging up clothes in the dark, I reason with myself out loud. What can happen to clothes in the dark air that we are afraid to leave them out overnight? Will they be gone in the morning because we let the dark have them? Will the dark cling to our clothes like vapors, making us do unpredictable things when we wear them? I decide I'm past the worrying point. I'm standing here in the dark, hanging up clothes, talking to my, myself about whether hanging up clothes in the dark is going to make me do insane things. I look at all the things I've hung up so far and figure they could be made whiter than white with the light from the stars. But why waste all that darkness? I have a blue shirt that faded a bit the last time it was washed. I hang it up last. I figure it will soak up a little midnight and be really stunning by the time the sun comes up. And this is for Diane Swan. Um, it's called How Diane Sent the Purple Finch. And the purple finches have just started coming back. They're incredible. Um, so How Diane Sent the Purple Finch for Diane Swan. You call her to check on a fact. But the fact is you've been stuck in the same gray groove for a month. You tell her, expecting sympathy, 
but she's no nonsense with the instructions. You need to get outside. Take a long walk in the woods. The spring beauties are out, trailing Arbutus, too. While she's talking, a flash at the feeder. You think at first it must be a mistake after the bird skimpy winter of browns and grays. He's red like someone poured paint on his head, fading down to white except for the rosy rump. Of course she'd be the one to send him. She has that coat like a red-winged blackbird and that hair. No matter how often you see it's turned white, you still remember it red. And of course she'll deny having anything to do with it as she keeps pulling them out of that deep hat and lets them fly one by one. Scarlet surprises she can't see, but we can. A long string of red songs, woman trailing beauties. <laughs> and Diane is just an amazing poet. Oh my God. I'm so glad you have a nice fat book now. Um, and springtime is, is hard uh, because just springtime is hard, but um, it's extra hard uh, for me since uh, my stepdaughter died in 2005. And in fact, um, I have written very little since then. And um, I'd like to read three po the three poems that I've written for my stepdaughter since then. Um, being stepmother to a child who has died is really weird. Um, you don't know quite what your place is. And I've spoken to another stepmother whose child died, and she said, yes, stepmothers are not supposed to have feelings. They're not allowed to have feelings. And there was a very strange way in which I felt invisible after um, we lost Etta. Um, so I've struggled with that. And uh, these poems are about Etta. Looking for Etta, and I wrote this in 2005, um, shortly after Etta died. The trouble with modern times is too many choices. We don't even know where to think the dead go. Some say a girl ends when her body does. Some say she flies above, others that she rests below. Some say the soul wanders for exactly 49 days. They tell me to check the local papers for birth announcements in seven weeks and keep track of any likely sounding babies. They might be my lost stepdaughter trying to get in touch. I do not check the birth announcements. What would I do with the so-called likely sounding baby peek in windows of strangers' houses at newborns and risk arrest, follow baby strollers down the street. Maybe next time she will come back as a boy anyway, which broadens the field considerably. I have been listening hard, though. I hear very little above her father's crying. Just one dream a wispy sense of her confusion at all the people gathered at our house. Where is that girl, I yell after a couple of months. It's time for her to come home for a visit. At least she could call us. Finally, something to mourn, this nothingness. Then the small empty pear inside me where I wish she'd been planted. But she doesn't want me to be the one to find her. She is waiting for her real mother, the one who kept leaving. Etta sits folded in the dark somewhere, nibbling on pomegranate seeds, the only food she likes. And this is called Looking for Etta Too. Cranberries were small until today, hardly worth looking into. Do such light and bouncy fruits deserve the name? Once out of the bag, they're bound to roll off the counter, dodge across the kitchen floor, and squat in the farthest corners, quivering and sour, waiting to be teased out with ridiculous instruments like the melon baller we never use. But muffins, your father wants muffins. Not that he said so. What he said was he thought he would make some. Cranberry. 
Then the baking tin he dragged, hopefully from the cupboard, sat empty for days, like he did for months after you, his only child, so tired a girl finally dared to say it, so tired. Lay down on your couch that too late afternoon to finally rest. Your father, young lady, hates leaving things half done. This half-started project screams you left him half-hearted. But muffins, he says, he wants. So I wash and corral the little buggers in a bowl, cut them in half so they won't roll. Look, these rascals have four chambers. Lucky them, their inner walls are white and tough all their red used up on skin, leaving none for bleeding in. And cranberries really do have four chambers, wow. just like your heart. I didn't know it until I did, until I made those damn muffins. <laughs> Etta talks to me two years after her death. The clothesline's talking to me again. Over two years I've avoided it, since that day, one week after my stepdaughter died. A mere rope made me sin against grief. I thought it was reflex, the way my heart lifted, watching those sheets fight the line in early May, their bellies filling with wind. Just a puny week after a child died, after only seven days of dragging cement feet, how could such joy be allowed? How else to explain it? Then some days the ambulance driver carries death and others throws candy in the parade. Though I wasn't allowed sugar, I stole this sweet, hid it away someplace I forgot. But last night she told me, eat every bit. Those pulls on the line, those squeakings and yankings were only my soul tugging free. And this is a really bad poem. Um, I, sorry, it's just really bad poem. Um, I, I wrote it, I wrote it um, six years after Etta died for my husband on Father's Day. It's about my children who love him dearly and who he loves back. Father's Day 2011 for Mick. You have all these stepkids, six counting spouses, who now, thanks to God, are in their own houses. <laughs> they are not your seed, but I've seen you clothe, feed, hector, and lecture until they take heed. Your world fell apart, and you let them enfold you. You let all those kid arms rock you and hold you. So don't be surprised when they have a hug for you. Duh, dear Mickey, they clearly adore you. <laughs> so stand up, stand up. They pound at the doors. They are not your seed, but you've made them all yours. <laughs> it's just, just a doggerel. It's a doggerel poem, but it was, yeah, he liked it. <laughs> and this is pretty recent, uh, 2015. It's about, well, what we're supposed to do when we get to be this age is, you know what? We gotta get used to the idea we're gonna die. So I just wrote this little poem. If this were my final moment in this life, the last thing I would see is that orange sitting on the cutting board, zest grated off into a pie. We're not so different, the orange and I, brains slightly dry, from having been around a while, but still able to add that little extra. It wouldn't be bad to go just now, this second, but please have my husband come up from the barn soon to find me croaked before the timer goes off and that pie burns. <laughs> <laughs> and, uh, <laughs> The last poem I would like to read is from my, my friend, Patricia Lyon Surrey, who uh, died in January riding her bike out in Tucson in the middle of her bliss. She was hit by a car and died instantly. 
and I really have not had a time, a chance to do anything in her memory, um, except go to a party to celebrate her life. But I really wanted to say goodbye. And um, the last, uh, one of the last things that Pat posted on Facebook from her vacation was, I love hiking alone. And there were other people on occasion. She was hiking out in the Saguaro National Park on the Hugh Norris Trail um, near Tucson. And this poem is by a wonderful poet named Fred Marchand from a collection called Tipping Point. You can tell it's all rippled. I've had it for a long time. It's a little moldy. Um, this is the last poem in his book. It's called The Afterlife on Squaw Peak. No matter the machines with their silent flywheels and strange swinging on ca It's weird. Let me start again. No matter the machines with their silent flywheels and strange swinging on cables that helped you get here. No matter the masts of measurement and reason which the earnest have strapped to the summit. There is still the terrible loneliness of the next valley over to convince you with its quartz and granite flashing like ice and its meadow emptied of the human. Flower blossoms, little trumpets of delight shudder at your feet. The shale you stand on is splattered with bright lichens. You join them by laying low out of the wind to look up the flower's name, scarlet penstemon. And you have that small but significant human pleasure of finally knowing. This high, you have trouble breathing. And feeling sleepy, you find a place without thorns. Your eyelids tighten, and the wind carries voices that seem shaken, as if assembled at your sick bed. When you wake, you note how little seems changed. You perhaps wonder where you came from and why. You want to take off your clothes and mark where you have lain. Now the wind sounds out clearly and says, this is the mountain of forgiveness, and that the work will be tra to traverse the empty spaces with meaning. If those you love glimpse you, it will be in the form of a red-tailed fox crossing at dusk into the wood stand. And because they have loved you, they will watch as long as you let them. They will not harm you, so swears the wind, not this close to heaven. Thank you.